before we get to our panelists, before we introduce you folks to everybody, um, we are honored to have uh, Jeff Goldner in today. Let me read his bio. Um, he is a GPEC board chair, fellow art lover, as you know. Uh, Jeff leads the Pinnacle West Capital Corporation and its primary subsidiary APS. The company is, of course, headquartered in Phoenix. Um, he was promoted to his current position in November of last year from his dual roles as president of APS and executive uh, vice president, public policy of Pinnacle West. Jeff, dedicated to uh, community involvement, actively serves on so many boards, including the Arizona Theater Company. Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Hey, Chris, thanks. And uh, good morning. And thanks, everybody, for joining us for this important regional, uh, regional discussion. You know, the, the arts and culture communities of Greater Phoenix just add such vibrancy and meaning to our lives and to our communities, and I think that's simply irreplaceable. Uh, I'm sure many of you join me in uh, missing a lot the ability to attend shows and concerts and exhibits with our friends and our family, and we look forward to that returning, and that's part of what this important discussion is about. Um, it, you know, investing in the arts has been a longtime priority of APS. It's, in fact, a major element of our corporate philanthropy model. And part of that is certainly because we see the positive impact it has on our communities. And part of it is because of the economic benefits that it brings to our communities. But as board chair at GPEC, I just want to provide a different, little bit different perspective on it. It's also really important as we think about growing the Phoenix area. And I've shared this story with a few, but to me, it just is what resonates so much about the importance of arts in our community. It was a number of years ago, I was working on helping to recruit a European company, a Spanish company to come into the Valley. And I was at a dinner with some of their executives. And I remember one of them talking to me and saying, look, I've got to recruit executives from Barcelona and Madrid. How do I sell them on Phoenix? And you know, one of the things that you have to be able to do, you can talk about sports, you can talk about lifestyle, but you've got to come back and talk about the centrality of arts in our community and being able to talk about having a rich symphony, a rich opera company, a rich theater scene, a rich performing and public arts scene. All of those are important as we grow this economy in the future. And we know that that's going to happen as we exit uh, this pandemic. So today what we're going to hear is more on the economic impact and the innovative resiliency that are displayed by members of the Greater Phoenix Arts and Culture communities. I want to personally encourage you all to support your favorite arts, organ arts organizations. It's so important to have that su support in this time of need because we want to have those arts available to us when we exit the pandemic. And also want to thank GPEC for hosting this important topic and giving light of this critical sector in our communities. So Chris, thank you so much and back to you. Thank you, Jeff, appreciate all those words. Okay, folks, this regional report kind of be broken up into two parts. Uh, first, our panelists are, are, are gonna kind of summarize, go through th some things, they have some slides for you to see, and then we're gonna open it up to some questions and answers. Okay, let me get to the panel. Let me introduce everybody, then I'm gonna read some bios and we're gonna hear from each one. Um, Joseph Benish, he is the Executive Director, Arizona Citizen for the Arts. He is with us. Kim Bogany, she is the Public Arts Director, Scottsdale Arts. We have Cindy Ornstein, she's the Executive Director of Mesa Arts Center, and Joseph Spector, the President and GM, General Manager of Arizona Opera. So all four uh, folks joining us, and uh, now I'm going to read each bio, and then we're going to get right into it, folks. So let's start with uh, uh, Joseph Benish, Executive Director for Arizona Citizens of Arts. Like I mentioned, he is committed to advocating for arts and culture and their deep impact on individual lives, local culture, and the greater economy. His roots are in uh, the greater Phoenix arts community. They run deep. He served eight years as the Director of uh, Phoenix Center for the Arts, 10 years in arts management at Phoenix Theater, Theater Works, and Stagebrush Theater. He previously worked at the Manhattan Movement and Arts Center in New York and developed programs and content for organizing, uh, serving the inner city youth and developmentally disabled young adults. Joseph Benish, thank you so much for joining the Regional Report. You, sir, have the floor. And the microphone. <laughs> Joseph, can you hear me? You, uh, think, you think I've done this enough to automatically. That's okay. I'm, I'm even good at uh, muting when I'm with my friends. 
<laughs> so thank you, Chris, and thank you, GPEC, for having this. The fact that you all are hosting this are, are shows and demonstrates that you all understand how integral the arts are. So I'm going to give a brief overview when we get to our PowerPoint, just so people understand a look at the state and a look at the economy. And then, of course, my friends and colleagues will get a little bit more into the detail. But uh, as, as Jeff said, you know, the arts are central. They're central to the human experience. They're central to any successful city. And I've called out a few of those in our slides. So let's run through the slides really quickly. And then I'll just say a couple words about them. So the first slide there is from the Arizona Commission on the Arts. That is our state agency, which invests money from the state budget into the arts around Arizona. And you can see how vital the arts are there to the state economy. The arts and culture organizations across the state, they collectively on their own generate, you know, about a hundred million dollars just in their own activities and, and payrolls. And that's just the nonprofits that we can measure. That's not including bars, which are hosting music. That's not including movie theaters. And that creates a domino effect of a $9 billion impact in the state and all that ancillary funding, something that's often called the multiplier effect. You know, everybody knows when you participate in the arts, you're not just doing that one thing, you're making a whole evening of it or a whole weekend of it. And of course it really impacts tourism as well. If we go to the next slide, we'll see a, a national look. That's a, that acronym is, talks about that arts and culture sector. And for the record, anytime somebody hears me say arts, I'm always thinking arts and culture. And so you can see what a massive impact that is uh, across the economy. It is very much money well spent. Next slide is a bit more uh, sobering of a slide is that sadly in Arizona, we have often been competing for last place. And that's, that's what we want. That's part of the story we want to tell. I'm a, I'm a competitive person myself. I want to move us from last up into the middle of the pack. And uh, it's, kind of an uh, interesting story to tell as, an, as a competitive person that you just want to be somewhere in the middle. We have long been in the high 40s, which is not a good number in terms of uh, state ranking and per capita spending on the arts. And everybody will get these, this dick afterwards. So people are, can feel free to dive into these numbers on their own. Next slide is another sobering one is that across the country, uh, really, really good data is showing that about 75% of artists are out of work. So, you know, that, that tells us, you know, that we need to do more to support them as we need to do with many, many sectors. You know, our arts organizations, they promote tourism, they, they promote the food and beverage industry, they impact hotels. So uh, there's a great saying that came out of Americans for the Arts, which is there can be no recovery without creativity. Next, we will go to some great case studies of places that, that do this really, really well. And this is not an, uh, a comprehensive list or an exhaustive list. Downtown Phoenix, rebuilt by the arts sector going back over 30 years when the um, first Fridays and Art Detour was started. All these other cities on this list, you know that they have these really strong art cores or these main streets. And then of course, Mesa Art Center, we happen to have Cindy on this call. This is that slide I've done before. I knew she was on with us. You know, Mesa invests their, their own money and their own taxpayer money into a vibrant core. And we've seen what that has done to Mesa. We've seen how many people show up in Mesa. So shout out to Cindy and, and her team. And then, uh, you know, that, that last sentence there is, what does anybody do when, when they go out for a night? There's always arts and culture involved in that. Next is for uh, anybody listening uh, who, who is part of a business, who runs a business, is what can you do? Advocate for the arts that you believe is important in your life. Partner with arts organizations. We've got some great ones you're going to meet here in a minute. Know that it's a safe bet that um, voters understand this. Uh, depending on the poll you look at, a vast majority of voters agree that they should be investing their taxpayers in the arts and then know the individual stories. And then the last slide is just one that I pulled from the, the partnership for, for the arts, which is for any business to know that when you partner with the arts, we're gonna help tell your story. You know, we have very loyal audiences, it's good business. And so sadly, uh, and that's the last slide, you know, sadly, Arizona, like the rest of the country, most artists are out of work. 
So we're just looking for people to be ready to open it up with us. Uh, you're going to hear some really creative programming coming up. On, on a personal level, I did just attend the Theater Works Curiouser and Curiouser, which, is, which was a magical experience where they converted their whole space into an immersive uh, experience for theater goers. And I'm really excited about the programming that the opera and some of the other ones are doing. So know that the arts are a major part of us and know that we need them to come back and come back strong. So it's an honor to work with my friends and colleagues. I love the arts, it, it saved my life. And I'm happy to hear from my friends and colleagues and happy that GPEC is doing this. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joseph. Great ending there. Need to come back, need to come back strong. We appreciate your presentation. We're gonna hear from you on the question and answer in just, just a little bit. Okay, let's move on. Our next panelist is Kim Bogany. Uh, Kim brings over 25 years of professional experience to her role as the public art director of Scottsdale Arts. Uh, she is responsible for the vision of Scottsdale's nationally recognized public art program, which serves as a leader in defining art in the public realm through creative placemaking, signature events, exhibitions, and installments, all which contribute to the community's creative, cultural, and economic vitality. She has worked for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Phoenix Art Commission, the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art, and the nationally recognized 40 Acres Art Gallery in Sacramento, California. Kim Bogany, thank you so much for being here on the Regional Report. We appreciate it. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you for having me here. I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about Scottsdale Arts first within the context of this being a nonprofit arts organization that actually works on behalf of the city of Scottsdale. So we're, our mandate is to put forth the arts. And a part of that is the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art, the Scottsdale Center for the Performing Arts, our educational arm, which is called the Scottsdale Arts Learning and Innovation Group, as well as what I'll be talking about a little bit more in depth, Scottsdale Public Art. So it's important to note that larger organization essentially got shut down in terms of our buildings back in March when COVID hit. And so it was a significant thing for us to have to pull back and regroup with regards to what we were doing and canceling a lot of what we're doing. But that said, our CEO, Gerd Wusterman, I have to call him out because he did a tremendous job of making sure, one, we had funding in place, uh, and two, just steering the ship forward with regards to what we were doing. We were fortunate in that we were actually able to keep all of our staff on board for what we were doing in the meantime. We have returned back though, so next slide, please. You will see uh, that our first performance at the Center for the Performing Arts happened just a couple of Saturdays ago on September 26th. As you can see from the artist on the stage, it's Jazz Kanpalma, which was awesome, uh, that they were socially distanced on the stage. So the staff had been working diligently since we had shut down in March to come up with protocol to determine what we need to do to ensure front of house and back of house is safe with regards to what we're doing, the artists as well as the patrons. If you see the next slide, you will see the audience and what the reality is now. This is an 853 seat theater. For this particular performance, we had 70 in attendance. We also had an additional 30 that zoomed in live stream to be able to see the performance. That's our new world now with regards to creativity, visual arts, and how we're going to be able to bring that back to, to what we're doing in Scottsdale. We realize we may not make a lot of money, but we very much want to drive for the, the city of Scottsdale, how we can put forth the arts. And so it's okay if the theater is a little more uh, spare with regards to what we're doing in order for us to be able to keep folks safe keep artists coming and working and move forward. I would also mention briefly, the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art just reopened as well with its first exhibition since it had closed in March. Our new reality for the museum, 16 people per hour, right? And timed entry. So it's gonna be very slow, very cautious, but it keeps the arts alive in Scottsdale, which is a big aspect of driving tourism um, for the city of Scottsdale. So next slide, please. So 
Scottsdale Public Art, as a part of this, has been busy in the meantime with public art. That has been the irony. The city has still seen projects moving forward construction-wise, so permanent public art projects have kept busy. It has also been a cool tourism thing with regards to coming up with drive-through arts performances or uh, public art experiences for people to see the permanent installations in the city. The other key aspect has been canal convergence, which is a huge economic driver with regards to tourism for the city of Scottsdale. It happens every November, 10 days, free public art experiences that are condensed at the Scottsdale waterfront. That's going to have to change. We are still moving forward with doing that, but it's going to be a new world with regards to what we're doing. Because again, it's about economic driver and it being this big impact for tourism, which has been significantly hit in Scottsdale. So next slide, please. I wanted to show you what it looked like last November. So you can get an idea of exactly what you will not see when you go to canal conversion this November. It is gonna not be about crowds condensed at the waterfront with the beer and wine garden and the food trucks and the live performances. We absolutely are not able, cannot do that. That just would not be prudent to do that. But we can rethink public art. We can rethink these events so that they can become experiences. So next slide, please. What we'll end up doing is the reality of what we have will instead become an opportunity for us. That's how we pivot, right? So no crowds at the waterfront, not gonna happen. Instead, we're gonna push all the artwork throughout downtown so folks can be in their cars safely, drive by and view them. We'll also have augmented reality artworks. Think Pokemon Go, right? Those will be the kind of elements you can view safely. So we can have the public art out there safely. So no food trucks, no live performances, no beer gardens will be there. Absolutely not. But we will drive visitors to the businesses that are near where all the artworks are. We want to make sure we're able to help them to also stay open, to be able to to generate revenue as a part of what they're doing. And then finally, for those performances that we'll be doing, it will all get shifted to online, which we're all familiar with. So live streaming, online workshops, online um, public art tours are all going to be a facet of what this November's Canal Convergence is gonna look like. So for us, we realize we're gonna keep it moving but we have to do it with the understanding that we have to be very, very safe. So we're looking forward to seeing what it's going to do and how it's going to roll out. Kim, thank you so much. And that last slide right there, um, I believe it's still up. It, it, it's a perfect slide. It, that split screen, the reality, the unfortunate reality of what you're dealing with, what everybody's dealing with. And then, though, that positive look, that, that optimistic spin, the opportunity that can come out of this, that silver lining and how you've adjusted and how you've pivoted. So thank you so much for sharing that. We appreciate that. Okay, let's move on to our next uh, panelist, Joseph Spector. Joseph has served as president and general director of Arizona Opera since June of 2016. Prior to that, he was the uh, general director at Austin Opera where he led the organization through a significant budget growth and major capital renovation. Joseph was also the director of the institutional relations at the Metropolitan uh, Opera, where he oversaw more than five million in annual fundraising. He is a former professional baritone and performed more than 20 opera and musical theater roles. So we are honored to have Joseph Spector in on our panel. Joseph, thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. And it's uh, great to be with you all today. I want to extend my thanks to GPEC for having all of us here. And as the group knows, it is my birthday and there is uh, no gift greater than to, uh, to be a part of this arts and culture community and, and to be able to talk about uh, what all of us are doing in order to continue serving uh, our community during such a difficult time. Uh, next. 
So just to talk about, uh, you know, the, the sort of obvious impacts that so many of our organizations have experienced in the case of Arizona Opera canceling our uh, season uh, and our final production of the year in Mar on March 16th, uh, including the postponement of our annual opera gala, which was a gut shot of about $150,000 uh, three days after our closure, or maybe two days after our closure. Uh, arts and culture organizations are adept at operating on thin margins, but that is, uh, that is the kind of impact that all of us have felt in one form or another, and, uh, and, and we had to overcome that. And of course, uh, cancellation of events like our uh, studio concert, uh, other fundraising events, in, in school education programs, those are about uh, not just the service to those communities, but our overall abil ability to uh, deliver connection, which of course is what all of us are here to do through our various art forms. Next. As we uh, began pivoting from this, uh, the, you know, this, this uh, you know, terrible crisis of, of uh, canceling our season early and figuring out uh, what we're going to do next, we had to establish some pillars. What, is, what are gonna be the drivers of our, our forward-looking course of action? And we really came to sort of three key points. One, our community, two, our team, and three, our financial resources. Uh, community maybe being primary. In this unusual time, how can we increase our connection to key stakeholders and the community at large and to maintain engagement and investment? Uh, not to accept just a, 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 main, a maintenance of connection, but actually how can we expand? How can we impact more people? And if we use that as a driver for our decision-making, how much more can we do uh, to help our community during this time? Our team, how can we ensure that we have the team necessary to execute both long and short-term plans? And uh, you know, I, uh, my heart goes out to organizations that for whatever reason have uh, had to cancel entire seasons uh, every organization has its own realities that they're grappling with, uh, but we were very determined, uh, I think like our, our colleagues at Scottsdale Arts, to try to uh, retain uh, as much of our team as we possibly could. Uh, we did have staffing reductions, seven uh, full-time staff, five part-time staff, and uh, wage reductions across the board that you know, we, we, we certainly have been in the game, uh, but we retained the majority of our organization through that time. And then financial resources, we, we wanted to make sure we were in a strong enough position on the other side of this in order to, again, continue our service through the art form of opera. Uh, next slide. The uh, board of Arizona Opera and the staff moved very swiftly after the cancellation of the season to engage in a number of activities to stabilize the, the company, including a, a board fundraising campaign uh, pursuing all of the aspects available to us uh, through the CARES Act, including a PPP loan. Uh, we were the beneficiary of, uh, beneficiary of uh, generous grants from uh, Piper NEA in the city of Phoenix, uh, without which it would have been much more difficult to, uh, to have the time necessary to plan for the next step. Next. We asked people through a variety of ways and maybe most uh, sort of prominently through a patron polling of what they wanted next. We wanted to make sure that whatever course of action uh, we took, it was aligned with uh, where public sentiment was. And back in March and April, that was very slippery. Uh, you know, you, you saw questions all the time, like, when do you plan on going back to the theater? Three months, uh, based not necessarily on any science, but just maybe a hope that we would be in a better place three months from now. But the thing that came through clearly in our, in our patron polling, which garnered over a thousand responses, uh, which is a, for, our, for our case, a very statistically significant number, um, we saw that people most especially wanted to see live outdoor opera performances and streams of operas. Uh, and we were very, very grateful that Ron and Kay McDougall, who are the supporters of the uh, McDougall Red Series, which bears their name, uh, stepped forward and became the leading sponsors of Arizona Opera's digital uh, programming for our upcoming reimagined season. Next. And what is that season? We opened actually just this past weekend with our studio spotlight series, which takes place here at the Arizona Opera Center on Tancer Plaza, named for uh, Bob and Shoshana Tancer, as well as in Tucson. We perform in uh, 
Friday in Phoenix and Sundays in Tucson. We had small audiences uh, in both of those locations to honor the uh, gathering size limitations, uh, just uh, only about 50 people on site for both of those uh, performances, uh, combining both the uh, staff and the attendees. But we had 1,400 viewers online from UK to France to Germany to Jordan, Switzerland, Germany, and Spain. And I think it's probably fair to say that this is the first time we've been able to serve uh, through our art form as Arizona Opera audiences in Jordan. And I think that goes to that, uh, that second side of Kim's slide, final slide about the opportunity. We can serve many more people with the right programming than we ever could before. Uh, Arizona Aria is a program of orchestral concerts that'll be coming up in the winter. We'll be doing our first film adaptation of an opera. Uh, in uh, January, we'll be shooting, and uh, in April, we'll be releasing that. And then a series of uh, podcasts slash uh, video uh, programs that we'll be sharing on Arizona Opera's Vimeo channel throughout the year. And all of that, as you can see, if you go to the next slide uh, and the one after that, um, we paired all of this with a robust uh, marketing and public relations campaign. Uh, to share with people that these, these, prog these programs are not also RANs to our normal season. We have thought very intentionally about how we can really bring a lot of value and entertainment and connection through opera this year, and uh, we wanted to have a, a public face on that that really celebrates that. And I do uh, want to just throw in as a closing note a special shout out to uh, Arizona Citizens for the Arts, um, with whom we engaged uh, with a number of our partners across the community in a awareness campaign called Arts for Arizona throughout the, uh, particularly the early days of this crisis. And uh, I just want to salute uh, Joseph uh, and all of our colleagues that signed on to that. It was uh, just a small way to say that we are in solidarity to get to the other side of this crisis and continue serving the community together. I, I believe wholeheartedly that the arts uh, and culture sector are going to be critical to the economic recovery, not just of uh, the greater Phoenix metro, but the country, and, and we're honored to be a part of that. Joseph, yeah, it was such a smart move, Joseph, to, um, to, to have that survey and to reach out to the community like, like you guys did and to get that feedback. Not only that, though, but then to turn around and implement it like you, like you showed in that slide um, with the outdoor events, with the online events, and then those silver linings with those online events. So uh, kudos to you adjusting, pivoting through uh, certainly this time. Okay, our final panelist is Cindy Ornstein. Cindy joined the City of Mesa as Director of Arts and Culture and Executive Director of the Mesa Arts Center in July of 2010. The Mesa Arts Center is Arizona's largest arts center, encompassing four theaters, 14 performing and visual arts studios, the five galleries of a Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum. She oversees the uh, IDEA, IDEA Museum, uh, and the Arizona Museum of Natural History. Prior to coming to Mesa, Cindy was the president and CEO of the Flint Cultural Corporation in Flint, Michigan, associate direct of the Allentown Art Museum in Pennsylvania. Cindy Ornstein, thank you so much for being here and for continuing to run that beautiful facility in Mesa. Thank you so much for having me. And I have to give a shout out to Joseph because he was the person who led that Arts for Arizona initiative. He, he started it. And then the other Joseph supported him and many of us joined on. So thanks for that, Joseph. Um, so we are part of the city of Mesa. So we, are, we, we have a direct governance from the city council. We also have a 501c3 support organization and both have been um, amazing in helping through these times. Next. This is just to remind us what Mesa Art Center used to look like and what we hope to get back to again eventually. We obviously, like others, cannot do this right now. Next. With the pandemic, um, we had to move quickly to respond. And you know, we, we, we had several things we needed to do. We needed to address the challenges of not being able to present our programming that is so dependent on in-person experiences the way we normally do. We wanted to create new opportunities to meet the, the needs of the community in this challenging time um, and, and to embrace change so that we could 
really uh, ensure that we were delivering services as broadly as possible, making as much impact as possible. Uh, we wanted to be on and beyond the screen. We knew we had to, we had to pivot and become a, a video production organization, which was something new. But we also wanted to make sure we were reaching people in whatever way we could and uh, dealing with alternatives to screen fatigue as well. We worked to preserve the core. What is the, the core programming and how can we translate it to this new world? but also innovate and provide new things. And we had a collaborative approach. Um, all the organizations, both of the arts and culture uh, department and many of our community partners and founding resident companies have been working together to bring uh, programming to the community. Next. So I'm not going to cover everything on these slides because there's a lot, but obviously in promoting the well-being and the creative inspiration and providing joy to the community, we had to look at all our programming. And as a multidisciplinary arts center, that is a lot. Um, we brought a lot, as I said, of regular programming to the screen, um, switching quickly to pilot and then roll out fully this fall online art studio classes, um, virtual tours, studio demos, etc. We, um, our engagement office and studio, the Art Studios program work together to create art to go which is a wonderful activity box. People can get with two activities um, in it with video instruction and written instruction. And we were lucky that we had something called snail mail art that our creative catalyst group has been doing for a while, bringing personalized artworks based on a questionnaire. And you'll see we've tried to exploit that for the current needs. Next. Um, we brought online interactive performing arts like Ben Seidman's camera tricks and other things that would be a little bit more participatory to really uh, change the, the nature of our interaction with, this, with the screen. And um, MCA Museum mounted a fantastic online competition. So show us what you got, got uh, art created during quarantine. And that was with weekly prize winners, but the entire gallery of 245 entries from 18 states was shown online. And again, reaching all kinds of new people. Next. We do already have core programs that reach vulnerable populations, quite a few of them, including our creative aging program and our arts and service free studio programs for veterans. And we did move those to an online format so that we could meet these very vulnerable populations that were um, you know, very isolated and to help reduce the stress of the situation and found that we did reach a lot of new people who normally couldn't come to our in-person sessions. So that was one of those many silver linings. Next. We really felt that building community was, was key, um, not only building our own, but also um, really expanding the um, opportunities for people to get out and use businesses safely, supporting restaurant takeout night, continuing our creative leadership class online, um, as we will do again this fall. Next. Um, we'll, we're about to launch our virtual Dia de los Muertos festival, and you can come see a fantastic exhibition that MCA mounted in the theater windows, where you can visit um, and just be safe and distanced outdoors and see a wonderful array celebrating the creativity of our art studios over the years. Next. Coming up uh, soon in mid-October, we're launching a wonderful uh, exhibition in, throughout downtown in store windows and outdoors of work by Ray Villafane, the amazing sculptor and installation designer and the community will be able to get out and really feel the joy of being part of the social fabric. Uh, we really wanted to exemplify the kind of creative problem solving that we uh, believe the arts bring to the community. Next. And finally, next steps. We have, uh, we, I won't read it all, but you can see we're, we're, we're working toward reopening um, 
In December and January, the museum and the art studios classes in succession will open. We're, we're very actively looking at Mesa Amphitheater performances with severely reduced capacity so that we can bring performing arts to the community again. We're going to be out in the community with our new Mabel, Mobile Art-Based Engagement Lab, uh, starting with no-touch and low-touch activities and moving uh, to more in-person, uh, hands-on when we can. Uh, the MAC theaters will remain closed until further notice to try to make sure we're not contributing to community spread. And we really are excited about using some of the things we've learned to expand our audiences and reach new people as, as things progress and things get better. Next. So this, maybe we'll be seeing some interactions like this soon, we hope. Next. And although we know it's not tomorrow, we're looking forward to when we can see scenes like this again on the Mesa Arts Center campus. Thank you. Cindy, thank you so much. Um, boy, busy, busy with the Mesa Arts Center. You guys <laughs> staying during this pandemic, wow. Um, and, and on one of your slides, you know, everyone has to adjust, everybody in, in, this, in this pandemic, but there was, I think, a line, everyone had to change, right? Uh, you put embrace change. That's something different altogether. Everybody knows you have to change, but it's, it's something, uh, another extra step to embrace that change and, 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 and create opportunities. And I, I know all of the panelists uh, mentioned that. Okay, on to our second uh, part of the, the, the webcast, the, the, the question answer period. Now, some of these questions um, we're not going to get to all of them, but some of them have already been addressed by you guys, by the panelists, but we're going to kind of go over them. And then just in lieu of order, I guess, uh, uh, Joseph Benish, let me address the first one to you, but anybody can jump in after these. So, so the first question is, and again, we've touched on this, but your personal opinion, make a prediction. I know you're a competitive guy. You said you're a competitive guy. Where do you envision, where, where are we going to be? in the arts and culture uh, community, say in the next 18 months? Because we don't know if we're in the second wave of this pandemic, still in the first wave. Is there going to be a third wave? What is your prediction? Well, based on what I'm seeing and never having experienced a global pandemic before, I, I think we're going to be kind of you know, midway in recovery in the next 12 to 18 months, specifically because of the creativity of artists and the leaders that you're seeing on this call. You know, artists never stop creating. Whether they're creating alone in their house, whether they're creating outside with their friends and family, that's probably why we've always felt that the arts are so important to communities, to cities, to families. It is, it is the, the tie that binds us, it is the humanities, it is the creativity. So they're gonna find ways to make art. So the out, outdoor performances, the, the mail-in art, the, the socially distanced ways to go, that's just gonna start happening because that's just what artists do. And you will see neighborhood, uh, mental health and economic recovery coming along with that. Artists and arts organizations, time after time, city after city, rebuild economies, rebuild downtowns. And you're gonna see that with this pandemic that the artists are gonna lead us coming back out of our doors and out of our living rooms, putting our pants back on and uh, making art just like they always do. So it's gonna happen no matter what. And the artists are again, gonna always be in the lead. Thanks Joseph for that context. We appreciate it. Anyone else wanna jump in with, with what they think is gonna happen say towards the end of 2021, maybe early into 2022 even? I'll just jump in to say that, you know, from our perspective, and I think this is certainly echoed in the public guidance, that we we will be served by not thinking of this uh, next year or so as a light switch sort of event where we will poof back to the previous normal and that maintaining a, a, a more nimble, uh, agile planning framework uh, and remaining mission focused is really going to be the key. That if we're always organized around the idea of service and are willing to adapt to whatever extent is necessary to maintain that level of service, that that is how we will be successful uh, going forward. And, and not to expect that light switch moment where it just poofs back. I think, I think we're, we're gonna get there at some point. 
but it's not going to be a, uh, it's not going to be binary. Kim, let me ask you this. Um, you showed that, uh, that photo on one of your slides of your, your, your Scottsdale theater there where there were just, just pockets of people. Not even, I guess that's the wrong word, not even pockets, just a few people sprinkled in and out with the masks on, thankfully. Um, how, given that scene, and, and this goes to everybody, but Kim, answer first, if you will. How do you stay positive when you look at that? Okay, because we're talking about this is a business, you know, you're trying to run things, you're trying to keep things afloat. How do you stay resilient uh, through this time? For me, it's about going back to those artists. It's how we can make sure the, the vision, the beauty of what these artists are doing are somehow getting out there. And so it may not be seen in the traditional way where you have a full house inside a theater, but instead it might be digital as well. So for us, the fact that we see sparsely crowded theater, that's not necessarily indicated something negative. It actually indicates those who are, are willing and wanting to get out of their house to figure out how to experience the arts safely. So for us, we're grateful for them that have come, that know we will do everything in our power to keep them safe while they're there. Because for us, it's about putting forth that grand, incredible artwork that those artists are doing. That's where it starts first, knowing all of us are just there to be able to experience that. It's going to be our new normal for a while. So looking at a theater that's 853 seats or a museum that is packed may not be around for a while. That's not necessarily a negative thing. It means we're just going to have to think differently about how we look at it. That will certainly be the same for Scottsdale Public Art and what we're doing with Canal Convergence, that we're spreading it out throughout downtown. That actually was something we had talked about before. Who knew COVID would be the thing that would push us to that point to do it? Um, so for us, we know people are gonna come by. We may not see them all together in that big crowd at the waterfront, but we will absolutely see them getting out, getting in their cars, driving by, so that they can enjoy, again, the beauty of what these artists are creating. And Chris, can I jump in as well? Please, please. So uh, you asked me, you know, how do we stay resilient? And I, I've got my advocacy hat squarely on when I, when I think about that question. Part of that recovery is government support. Abraham Lincoln said that, and part of the government's job is to do what people can't do for themselves. And we know that our country, according to all the top level economists, can tolerate more support. So part of what we have to do, and I say this as an independent, I'm, I'm, I've never joined either, either party, need to come together at the federal level and offer more support to our states and then have that you know, continue to be shared out. As I think a couple of people said on this call, there's been some great examples of that, certainly in, in my city, the city of Phoenix and other cities around our state. We need more support so that way those artists can do what they do well, which is create spaces for people to come out out of their doors and get back into their cities. We, you know, the arts or, will lead this recovery with creativity and we need that government support at all levels. And people, especially in Congress, have to come together. I wanted like to, to go oh, ahead. Say, I just go, wanted no, to add that I, I, I completely agree. And I wanted to say that I also find a sense of resilience when I think about the fact that what we do, um, bringing creative thinking, creative problem solving, and getting people in touch with their capacity to address the challenges around them is really what's going to carry us forward into a successful future. I believe that the there's going to be a blossoming of innovation that results from people needing to spend their wheels have their wheels turning all the time about what to do about the current cir circumstances. So I am optimistic that we're going to see a recovery that is in fact, as Joseph said, fueled by creativity. And it's going to help people realize how critical that is to getting our economy back, to building our communities, to helping people come together across um, different uh, ways of viewing the world and different backgrounds and it's going to be the crux of what makes us strong in the future. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the ability 
to get where we have to go because of creative thinking and creative problem solving. That's good. That's great. Um, uh, and Cindy, thank you so much for chiming in there w with that. Now we do have, and we're going to get to these. We do, I, I'm just getting in some, uh, some viewer questions. I want to get to at least a few of those, but first, before that, Again, my own curiosity, uh, something that Joseph uh, Benish said, I want to address to uh, Joseph Spector, because uh, number one, Joseph said earlier, uh, and you all concur with this, that, you know, artists create. It's what they do. They, cre they have to be creative. They're always going to create. Uh, Joseph Spector, from your perspective, being a, a former performer, um, how... What have you seen uh, in, in your organization, in, in the opera there, from the performers, being a former performer, how have they dealt with this? Because, yes, creative people always create, but no one's ever been through a pandemic, like Joseph mm -hmm. said. You know, yeah. I mean, it, does it stymie that creativity at all? And if so, how do you get out of that? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I think... I, I can speak a little bit about my experience, not just with our artists that performed this past weekend open our season, but also what I've heard from colleagues that are still active in the field. You know, it's, it, it is uh, such an emotional time. And as Joseph Benish said, you know, all artists want to do is create. Uh, that the emotional content of our first performance on Friday was almost indescribable. And I, I don't know if Cindy, if you experienced this when you had uh, your performance on September 26th, but uh, I have never felt so much uh, pent up energy around, around a simple performance. The act of creating this you know, one hour program, appreciating that it was going to be shared online, but after essentially a seven month absence from the stage, it, 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 it would really be difficult for me to sum up what that felt like. It was palpable. And you know, it, is, it, it is a time where uh, our, uh, colleagues who are artists and other creatives are hurting tremendously. Uh, we do want to create opportunities for them to express their, their, their art and their creativity and the connection that that work provides in as broad a platform as possible. Uh, but it's, it's a wild experience uh, you know, to, be, to be stepping back into that fray. And uh, all I can say is um, just to, to sort of add on to what the group was saying on the last topic, uh, I really believe that you know staying mission and vision focused uh that is really the key because i believe that the resources will flow to organizations that that continue to provide that service to provide the opportunities for artists to perform it is a, definitely a leap of faith on the part of our organizations to say we're going to do this stuff we need we need the uh, public and private sector to step up to support us so we can maintain that connection um, but uh, it's an honor to do it, and it's an honor to be part of this community, uh, to work for an organization where the, the, the staff and the board are so terrific and in sync, and uh, the more we focus on that, um, that, uh, you know, that sense of connection on all of those levels, the more successful we'll be as a sector. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that, Joseph. Uh, we have a, a question from a viewer. This is for Kim. Kim, now I know you sort of, you, you, you mentioned this, you may have touched on this in, in some small detail, but the, the listener asks, how will the changes to the canal convergence uh, 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 affect your overall budget? Um, if, if you can divulge those details, if you even know. It, it actually already has. I mean, that was actually a part of the decision making. So for canal convergence, it's, it's funded primarily by way of Scottsdale's Tourism and Development Commission. So that funding is basically coming from bed tax dollars, of which from March through uh, June, it was just decimated because there was no tourism in Scottsdale at all. So there was actually a big impact negatively on the funding of any and all events that the TDC, as it's known for short, um, funds. That said, they still, because of their belief in the importance of canal convergence and how we can uh, do this event, they still put some funding forward uh, toward canal convergence as its major sponsor. So we, we got, I'm gonna say it was about 40, 30% less than what we would typically do for this event. And so where that impact existed was in 
the physical plant. So it's actually a bonus for us because typically, let's say that 30% would go to pay for all the things that we would need at the waterfront for that event. So it would be things like the porta potties or the security or the tents or all those things, staging. But instead, because we no longer can afford to do that, we really couldn't have it at the waterfront anyway, because that's where that money went. So for us, we were actually able to preserve the bulk of what we get for funding towards the artist, towards the artworks. And so that is what was preserved so to allow us to then be able to just spread what we're doing throughout downtown. So we did get impacted um, financially on that, but we just had to pivot yep. and, and see how are we going to do uh, a revised canal convergence in the face of that. Yep. Do what you need to do in this time, but also uh, rely, if there was ever a time, and this is for everyone, for donors, for donations, right? This, this is the time. And I know, Joseph, you mentioned some, some grants like the Piper Trust and, 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 and the PPE and all that, uh, PPP, but, um, the, you know, this is the platform to ask for that, right? And how, how in fact, are you guys doing that? Is it, is it the usual sort of ask or, it, or, or have you pivoted to, to something else during this time? Again, it's the first time everyone's ever been through this. So how are you addressing that? Well, I will take that one briefly and then I'll pass it to the others to basically say for us, we actually had to do a couple of things. And again, I'm speaking specifically with regards to canal convergence. One, talk to a number of the funders who had already signed up to keep them on board. This is over and above TDC, but to basically talk with folks to make them understand we are still doing this. So we still wanna keep you on board. I think we only had one, maybe two sponsors who said, you know what, we're gonna pull our funding and just wait until next year. They actually understood our story and were committed um, to being there um, for this event. So we're grateful for that. Yes, our, our sponsors have stuck with us and are re-upping for next year. Uh, some of them and some of the grant granting organizations have allowed the monies that were for programming that had to get canceled to be used for other programming or general operating. So the community has really stepped up. Um, we also found that for some of the things we're doing that are really making um, experiences accessible in different ways. People were willing to come forward and support us with uh, sponsorships for things like the, the um, Strange Encounters Halloween installations, um, the, um, the virtual Dia de los Muertos Festival. There was an interest in, in helping the community by helping us bring these programs forward. and. Um, we also have been able to retain a large percentage of our members during this time. So I'm very impressed at how people understand and are stepping up. What um, kind of piggyback on, on that? Let, let's go post pandemic, whenever that is, okay? And for everyone here, because um, I know in my industry, post pandemic, uh, the people that I interview aren't always going to be in person, even when it can be. Uh, this has, op what we are doing right now has opened up a door uh, for convenience. Um, in the world of, of the local art and culture community, are we gonna see only like the, the slide that, that Cindy uh, put out there towards the end with everybody there and everybody packed together and enjoying it like we used to? Or are we gonna see a, a, to a varying degree of that? Um, uh, Joseph Benish, you, you start with that one. That's a great question. I'm going to say varying degree, but I think we've been through pandemics before as a, as a globe. Humans are naturally connected to each other. We're a social creature. And I don't see that the need for that sort of large scale celebration connection going away. Yeah, it was slowed and we, we have to learn to be more careful with our health and washing our hands. You know, the great lesson here is to always wash our hands. And we're going to come back together. And because we have all these great things to come back together for, for each other and for the arts. Maybe I not agree. Shake hands. I Maybe think not shake hands, but we'll come back <laughs> because of washing hands. 
Go ahead. Yeah, Cindy. I agree. I think people are, are really yearning for those in-person experiences and will be quick to take advantage of them um, over time. It'll be a gradual uh, changeover. But I think at the same time, we will never do things exactly the same because we're going to take these new tools and we're going to figure out how they let us do things we couldn't do before or how we they let us, as I said, reach people we didn't reach before. Um, you know, I, a lot of us participate in various organizations and meetings and we've all found um, when I talk to people that we have better participation in meetings than before in most organizations I participate in. I think we're going to see the advantages of this new way of doing things combined with the beauty and connectivity of the old way of doing things. Joseph or Kim, you want to jump in before we kind of close up shop? I, I was going to chime in on that, but I think Cindy just articulated it perfectly. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 it, it would be a, a double tragedy uh, if we did not take the learning that we're having right now and figuring out how we can serve people more fully and carry that forward somehow. But uh, Cindy really just said it uh, so perfectly. So I'm grateful for that. 